Hej, det är tar är allt jag kan säga på svenska. Jag kommer fortsätta prata på engelska, ok? Ja, yeah? alright. Uh -huh. So, uh, as Thomas mentioned, I am a, uh, a senior edu uh, educator and consultant with an organization called Perceptual Edge. We are a vast multinational consultancy with a headcount. There we go. With a headcount of three. I can say multinational because, as Thomas mentioned, I'm from Ottawa, Canada. My colleagues are, are based in, in California, one of whom is, is Stephen Few. Uh, has anybody come across Steve's work in the past? Yeah, a few people. Yeah, he's fairly well known in the data visualization and dashboard design space, primarily for the books that he's written. He's written uh, uh, four books in this space. And he and I teach workshops, uh, one, two, three, sometimes four-day workshops based on on these books. I spend about 60% of my time doing uh, workshops, training workshops, but 30% on consulting, where I'll actually go into large organizations like Fortune 1000 companies and, and uh, uh, NGOs, government agencies, and design information dashboards for their senior uh, executives. And I spend about 10% of my time speaking at conferences uh, like this. And when Thomas told me what the topic of this particular conference was going to be, I knew exactly which book I wanted to recommend. I don't know if anybody's ever read this. Uh, it's quite an old book. It came out in 1954. It was an immediate bestseller. And it, it kind of illustrates very well the notion that, that most people understand uh, or are well aware that it's actually quite easy to, to deliberately mislead an audience, to deliberately misrepresent data with, uh, um, with statistics, you can cherry pick your methods, for example, and pretty much tell whatever story you want. Most people are also aware that you can do the same thing with graphs. If you want to, you can deliberately mislead people. You can deliberately misrepresent the underlying data. You can see in this example, this is a, an ad for a medication called Crestor. And the designers clearly use some kind of dirty tricks to manipulate our perception of the data to make certain values look like they're maybe a lot larger than other values that they really are if we were to look at the raw data. But what far fewer people realize is that it's just as easy to mislead your audience with a graph by accident, right? where you are trying to be as honest and as truthful as possible where you are not trying to deceive anyone, and yet you end up giving the audience an incorrect interpretation of the underlying data. And so this doesn't just happen with, uh, with graphs. It happens with all forms of communication, including written communication. As I'm sure you know, you, you've, you've, uh, th there's been texts that you've read where you're thinking, well, I'm not sure that this is what the author meant to say. Like in this example, I, I'm, I'm sure that this isn't quite what they intended to say, but because they probably had no training on how to communicate clearly, how to write clearly, they've ended up conveying kind of an incorrect message. Uh, or for this restaurant, for example, I, I'm, I'm sure they don't actually incorporate human beings into their hamburgers, but unfortunately, they ended up saying something that came out just kind of a little bit wrong. And as we'll see, this also happens a lot with uh, with graphs and like writing like with writing there are virtually unlimited number of ways that you can accidentally lie with graphs and so my goal isn't to walk through all the ways because that would be impossible but it's really just to kind of sensitize you to the fact that it is in fact a lot easier than most people think to uh, accidentally lie with graphs and i'm going to do this through uh, through a couple of scenarios a couple of stories i like stories Data storytelling is great. I'm going to talk a little bit about that at the end. And oh, also, yeah, Thomas let me know that uh, there will be a little bit of time for a Q&A at the end. And so if you have questions, hold on to them. And if there's time at the end, uh, we'll spend a few minutes uh, answering those. First scenario. So our organization is doing OK. We've got five regional offices, north, south, east, west, and central. And we've recently done some surveys amongst our employees to kind of try and gauge their, their level of satisfaction. 
And so your job, you're a BI analyst, let's say, and you're asked by management to, uh, to graph this data to, to produce something that can be discussed at the management meeting. Okay, so uh, here are our five regions. We've got average employee satisfaction out of 10. Kind of boring, right? All the values are pretty much the same. They, they fall around eight. And they're so close together, in fact, that it's actually kind of hard to see the differences between them. And so you sort of you know, think to yourself, you look at this and think, well, you know, because everything falls roughly between about seven and a half and eight and a half, why don't we just show that part of the scale? Ah, okay, it's kind of more exciting now. It looks like bigger differences. Uh, I can certainly see the differences between the various values more clearly, so great. You're happy with this. You send it to the management meeting. And then you get this furious phone call that afternoon from the director of the central office saying, I just got a call from the CEO. He was chewing me out. Look, you know, you're, you're, the morale of your employees is less than half of all the other regions. Because this graph appeared in a report that had a lot of other information. It had 15 other graphs and lots of tables and numbers. And so in the management meeting, they are scanning through it. And what this was telling them was that the, the morale of the central region was less than half of every, everywhere else. Is that the truth? No, it was lying. Were you trying to lie when you created this graph? No, you weren't trying to deceive anyone. But you know, there's been a lot of research into this area, and the research clearly shows that when, you see, when people see bars, their eyes automatically start to compare the lengths of those bars before they even know what they're looking at, before they even know what kind of data they're looking at in the first place. But of course, uh, in, a, in a professional news organization, for example, something like this would never happen, right? This kind of basic error? Well, unfortunately, not the case. So this is from a major US network, Fox News. You know Fox News? <laughs> yeah, so do I. And during, this is during the Obama years, and they're, they're talking about what's going to happen if Obama lets President Bush's, the previous president's, tax cuts expire. Oh my God, our taxes are going to go up by, what, six, seven times? Is that the case? No, but it requires closer examination, right? Probably 90 plus percent of the audience who saw this, especially since it was on TV, where people don't look at things very closely, came out of this, you know, after this graph, thinking that their taxes were going to go up seven times. But the good news is, when this happened, the pushback, the blowback was so hard that they never did it again. And uh, I'm just kidding. Well, so during this very same year, unfortunately, uh, this this is when the government was trying to get people to sign up for Obamacare, the sort of quasi-universal health care, and same network, oddly enough, Fox News. Says, Look at this, oh my God, you know, only four days to go before the deadline, and, we're, and they're barely a third of the way to the target, right? Obviously not. At least they put the numbers here. It makes it a little bit more obvious that they are lying, but still, still lying. And uh, there's actually a, a, an American comedy show, Saturday Night Live, that picked up on this. And, and after this graph was published, a few days later, they, they put out this, which I thought was kind of funny. So one of, the, one of the common ways, one of the many ways that people accidentally, or perhaps deliberately, sometimes lie with graphs is that when using bars, when using bars specifically, they start the bars at something other than zero. And so uh, one of the best practices that I recommend when I do training workshops is that you don't do that. You know, when you, when you've got bars, you start the, the axis at the, an origin of zero. That's, I think, kind of well summarized in this graph that I created. But of course, this, this should really be up, up at 100. There's, there's really no, no green area there. All right, another scenario. So now we're, a, uh, we're an investment company. People give us their money, and we invest it. We try and get a good return for them. But our particular investment philosophy is that we want to invest equally in all major sectors of the economy. And so I ask one of my financial analysts to give me a breakdown of our investments by sector, produces this. Great. Here we are. 
but we're clearly almost perfectly equally distributed across all the various sectors of the economy. But just for fun, and admittedly I might have a strange idea of what, what is fun, uh, I decide I'm going to take the same data and put it up as a bar chart. Oh, kind of a different story, eh? In fact, these values are not all evenly distributed. In fact, they range from about 14% to about 18%. And that's a pretty big difference. The largest value is more than a quarter greater than the smallest one. And oh my goodness, look at this. We completely forgot to invest in telecom. There's a whole sector there that was not represented at all. Not very obvious with this. And there are a lot of perceptual issues around uh, pie charts I don't really have time to get into. But again, you know, my financial analyst who produced this wasn't trying to deceive me. And yet, unfortunately, they ended up lying. Another scenario. So now we work at a, a large hospital. And like all large hospitals, or hospitals of any size, really, we're very concerned about the rate of hospital-acquired infections. This is where you go into hospital and you come out with an infection that you didn't have when you went in, which unfortunately is fairly common. And so you know that everybody on the management team is wondering, are we investing enough in solving this, this problem? And so you do a bit of research and you come up with this, come up with this graph. So what this is uh, telling us is that you've decided to use a dual access chart. On this side are hospital acquired infections and was represented by this kind of pink line. And on this axis, we have infection control costs in blue. And so you bring this to the management meeting and you explain to everybody, look, I think we're doing okay in terms of investing in this problem. Our investments have been increasing at a much faster rate than the actual problem that we're trying to solve. There's no crisis here, no problem. I think we might even want to kind of curb the increase in our spending a little bit. And then you've barely finished saying this when, when Frank, Frank at the other side of the table, Frank, who is gunning for your job, stands up and says, oh, well, I've actually done the same analysis. I've done the same research. But I came up with something that was actually a little bit different. And he starts distributing a graph. Graph looks a lot like yours, but not exactly the same. Because Frank's graph says pretty much the opposite, in fact the rate of, of hospital-acquired infections is skyrocketing, is shooting up. And look at our investments in it. The, the blue line here, that's almost flat. We're barely increasing at all. This is a crisis. We need to massively increase spending so that we can actually combat this problem. And so, but you, you were very careful in your analysis, right? You know that your data is fine. And so you say, well, look, Frank, I think, I think your data might be a little bit off. And so you, you bring up your data, you bring up Frank's data, and you realize that it, it's actually the same, identical, same data. So what happened? Well, as it turns out, you just had different scale. And so Frank's scale goes from 65 to 90. Your scale goes from 0 to 100. Your scale goes from 135,000 to 155,000. Frank's goes from 100 to 180 completely change the story. So obviously, at least one of these is lying. They can't both be true, right? They're saying pretty much the opposite. Who thinks that your graph is more honest, more truthful than Frank's graph? OK. Who thinks that Frank's graph is more honest and truthful than your graph? Pretty, pretty even split. I think they're both lying. The problem with dual access charts is that these scales can be anything. You can scale them however you like and tell pretty much whatever story uh, uh, you like. And so if we did actually want to compare the rates of change of these two, uh, two variables, we might do something like this. There's a bunch of ways you could do this. This is one of them. So here we've pegged the, the first month, January, as zero, and shown subsequent months relative to January. And so I can see, for example, that in July, uh, the rate of hospital-acquired infections was about 13% higher than it was in January. 
this is actually the truth, because what this is showing is that hospital-acquired inf infections are actually increasing at a, quite a bit of a faster rate than our costs, and if we want to keep pace, we should probably be ramping up our, our investments in this problem. Another scenario. So this time we are an e-commerce company, and like all e-commerce companies, we keep a close eye on our metrics, number of visitors, orders, that kind of thing. And so we might see something like this on a dashboard, a daily dashboard. And as the person responsible for these metrics, I'm looking at today's numbers going, wow, look at orders. That's fantastic. Eight, eight and a half percent over yesterday, and it almost never increases that much from one day to the next. Awesome. Yeah. In fact, it's so good, I'm going to bring this to my manager. You know, I can almost smell the promotion. All right. And so I bring it to my manager, and she is also suitably impressed. This is great, yeah. But I, I want to know, has, has this been happening for a while? Let's go back and look at, I don't know, say the last two weeks. And so you sit down together, you look at the last two weeks, and ah, oh, crap. <laughs> so in fact, this metric is not trending upward. This graph was clearly lying. And in fact, the, the big jump that we experienced yesterday wasn't so much that, or today rather, wasn't so much that we had a great day today, it was because we had a truly shitty day yesterday, and we basically just recovered, that's all. And so that first graph on the dashboard was definitely lying. Now, your manager is, is actually pretty upset now, <laughs> and, uh, seeing this, and they, you know, I'm sorry, this is actually a huge problem. I need to bring it to senior management, but before I do that, I want some more context. Go back to your desk, find out how long this slide has been happening. When did it start? So you're pretty bummed out, go back to your desk, and uh, say, okay, how about we look back, I don't know, not 14 days, 140 days. Oh, come on, man. <laughs> actually, this is increasing. It's just that it's experiencing a cycle. It um, looks like a monthly cycle of some type. So maybe at the beginning of the month, that's, that's when our monthly newsletter goes out, or we have our monthly beginning of the month sale, or something is happening. And so I just happen to be looking at the last little bit. And so this is actually a much better picture of the truth than either of the first two, right? The first, these graphs were in fact both lying. And in fact, you see these kinds of things all the time, right? These these period to period comparisons versus yesterday, versus last week, versus last month. Those are almost always misleading because really what you're seeing is just noise uh, from one period to uh, to another. There are solutions to address this, but they involve a little bit of statistics. I don't really have time to to get into uh, here. All right, we're at a new company now, a different company. And uh, we want to look at headcount because we've been doing really well for the last little while. Month over month, we know our headcount has been increasing. And so as a, as a BI person, I've been asked to, uh, to show a visualization of this. And yes, indeed, our headcount has been increasing quite, quite a bit. Great, the company's doing well. This graph is actually lying, though. It's not in an obvious way. Can anybody actually, it is visible, but it's not obvious. Can anybody spot it? Okay, I'll, I'll give you a clue. I'll mark off each data point with a little circle. Now, do you see it? Look at November. Yeah, we're missing the value for November. We don't, for whatever reason, that's, you know, we just don't have it. They forgot to update the system that month or whatever. And yet, this graph looked like we knew what the value for November was, that it was halfway between October and December, whatever those values were. But that's not the case. For all we know, reality might look like this, might look like that, and those are entirely different stories, right? And so the graph was saying that we knew things that we didn't actually know, which is a form of, of lying, of course. At least it didn't look like this, which is unfortunately the way a lot of software still works, is that it treats null values or unknown values as zero. 
But at least in this case, we know something's wrong, right? I mean, the, pu the plus of this is that we know it's lying. It's, it's very obvious. The way that, uh, that I would handle this, or sorry, I, I've seen this handled like this, but I don't, still don't think this is very truthful because this looks like an estimate. It looks like we have some idea of what happened in November, but the reality is we don't. We have no idea what happened in November. Really, this is, in my mind, the only kind of safe way of doing this where you're telling the truth. You're saying, what do we know and what do we not know? And there's no ambiguity around it. All right, back at the same company. And now our exec the executive team is asking me about sales data. You know, I think sales have been okay, but kind of flat for the last 12 months. But let's have a look at the data and see how things are going. Oh, my God. Oh, maybe it's time to find a new job. This is terrible, right? Or is it? Again, this gra graph is lying. Can anybody see where? December 10th, that's right. These are all complete months, except this is as of only part of December. Of course, this value is lower, right? We're only 10 days in. It's almost certainly going to be higher by the end of the month, right? And yet, unless people are paying attention, they're going to think that there's a crisis here which does, isn't actually happening, right? So this graph is, is definitely lying. And especially if it didn't specify that this was the middle of the month, then it would be really lying. Again, I've seen people try and solve this problem like this, but I, I don't think this is a great solution because it looks, again, like some sort of projection or estimate that this is our best guess as to where we're going to land by the end of the month. But that's not true. Nobody thinks we're going to land there at the end of December. Something like this is more obvious. Right? We're really underscoring the fact that this is a partial month, making it harder to not notice that. So this would be more truthful. If this, this, this is the metric that we can actually project somehow in the, in the, into the future, sometimes you can't, sometimes you can. It depends on the metric. Got to be really careful with predictive analytics. But let's say we can. Then I might use a, a, a dashed line because this is actually an estimate. This is actually a guess as to where we might land. So hopefully not too many people at this point thinking back to that graph that they created last week or last month, and you know, oh my god, no, what have I done? Don't blame yourself too much. Uh, there are unfortunately, uh, like I said, a virtually unlimited number of different ways to lie with visualizations. And so it's, it's not the kind of thing that, um, uh, it's, it's not the kind of thing that, that is, you know, you can get like a 10-item checklist or something to, um, to, you know, to go through and it'll figure out if your graph is lying or not. You just have to kind of uh, learn the fundamentals. But don't worry, uh, it, it does get worse. Being misleading is only one of the reasons why graphs fail to communicate. There are unfortunately a lot of others, like graphs that are ambiguous. For example, if you have the same graph and you show it to two different people, and they come away with two different stories, two different impressions of what's going on. And unfortunately, that, that is fairly common uh, as well. Graphs that are esoteric. So you're showing scatter plots or box plots to people who don't understand how to read scatter plots or box plots, which is actually a lot more than you, you, you'd imagine. Graphs that are overwhelming. This is a very, very common problem where, and I'm sure we've all experienced it, where you've got this very busy graph and there's just too many stories being told, too many data series within a single graph. It has to be broken apart in some way because otherwise people just, that first impression is just, I, I, I can't visually decode this. But where the story is unobvious. This is also very common where you look at a graph and think, okay, I get it, I understand what I'm looking at, but is there a point to this? Is there some kind of decision that I'm supposed to make based on this? You know, what, what is the story here? We're talking about storytelling today. Oftentimes, unfortunately, the story is really not, not obvious as to what it, should, uh, what it is. Occlusion, this happens a lot with 3D graphs, where you have hidden data, bars behind bars, lines hidden behind lines. And so it's not that the graph is lying in that case, because people can see that they're missing something, but they just can't see what they're missing. Uh, incoherent, 
we've actually, some, some of the graphs that I've shown already suffer from this, where the first impression of the graph doesn't line up with subsequent understanding. And so your first impression is, oh my God, there's a crisis. But then you look at it for you know, 15 or 20 or more seconds, you go, oh, actually, no, there's no crisis. Uh, so, so my first impression didn't match up. That shouldn't happen. Your first impression should be consistent with subsequent understanding of the graph as you continue to look at it. It doesn't mean that you should understand the graph at a glance. Sometimes a graph takes 15 or 20 or, or 30 seconds to fully absorb, and that's fine. But the, the initial impression shouldn't conflict with the uh, subsequent impressions. Insufficient precision. And so if you know that your audience has to be able to eyeball the actual values of, of bars or, or points on a line to within a few percent in order for the graph to be useful to them, but they can't do it because of the design, they can only eyeball them to within 10 or 20 percent, that's, that's another problem. Again, it's not, not that the graph is lying, it's just insufficiently precise. Or that it's ugly. Making fugly graphs, we've all seen those. But why? Like, who cares? You know, if you're not making an infographic or something, if you're creating graphs for business, for internal consumption, for shareholders, anything like that, then what does it matter if it's ugly? Well, it actually matters a lot. Because then people will focus on how ugly your graph is, as opposed to focusing on the data, which is not what you wanted. And there's also a risk that people will have, uh, will attribute less credibility to your data. They'll actually believe the data less. And there's some studies that, that suggest this. Unfortunately, the studies aren't very well designed. But you know, intuitively, I think that that is a risk, that people are, aren't going to trust the data as much simply because it looks ugly. Graphs with highly uh, saturated colors and really thick lines, for example, or lots of decoration. I fully agree with Anna. You know, get rid of the decoration. Talked about that before. So. Like, uh, like learning how to write, like I said, there's no quick shortcut to avoiding lying with graphs. You just have to do the work. You have to learn the fundamentals. It's not, uh, you know, it's, it's not rocket surgery. It's not very difficult. It, you, know, you can learn, but if you read a, a good book or two or some, some good training workshops, it's not difficult to learn, but it's not intuitive either. It's not the kind of thing that you can just guess and figure out and kind of muddle your way through on your own. There, there are a lot of books on data visualization out there. Unfortunately, most of them aren't very good. They fall into really two categories, two categories of crap. They're not all crap, but a lot of them are. The first category are books that are written by people who are essentially just sharing their personal opinions. Like, well, I think this works. I think this looks good. It's like, well, that's probably not very useful to you because there is actually, a lot of people don't realize that data visualization is a full-blown academic field of research. There's been a lot of research done really getting uh, off the ground in the 1930s. There's an enormous body of knowledge out there where you know, uh, people doing PhDs bring subjects into labs and they test uh, different types of visual representations. They time how long it takes people, how many milliseconds it takes people to understand what they're looking at, and they quiz them afterwards. And so if, if you know, uh, unfortunately, like I said, a lot of books are written by people who are not aware of this research, um, which is too bad. And then the other category are books that are written by academics who uh, may or unfortunately sometimes may not be aware of, of the research that's been done, but they're often not aware of how data visualization is used in the real world, in real organizations uh, by, by real people. And those are unfortunately of limited value. I can recommend uh, a couple of books, and I'll put my email address up at the end if you want, I can send you a, a list. But unfortunately, it, the quality and usefulness really falls off pretty fast outside of this, this very short list. I'm biased, of course, I put some of Steve's books in there, but they are truly excellent books. We also have a blog where Steve and I write regularly about data visual or visualization topics, um, which is full of great information. We've got a quarterly newsletter. It's free. I recommend everybody sign up. Uh, we have discussion forums where people get very passionate about this kind of thing, which is, uh, which is good. 
if you happen to work for a uh, data visualization software vendor, you might want to put on some thick skin because we bash those guys mercilessly, companies like Microsoft and Oracle and IBM, which unfortunately encourage terrible practices through their products. And that's why I usually end off with a warning. You know, yeah, I'm kind of the wet blanket part of the, 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 the conference, I apologize. Uh, but when you're, when you're Googling, when you're looking for best practices, you got to be really careful because, I mean, if there are a lot of bad books out there, there are even more bad blogs out there. And even when you come across white papers and videos and information from major software vendors, you know, it's pretty easy to think, well, hey, you know, it's good enough for IBM, it's good enough for me, right? Ugh. I could show you some stuff from IBM that would just curl your toes. And I will, uh, I will leave it with that. Thank you very much.